Philip II of Macedonia is someone whose memory has nearly been lost to the sands of time. Unless you're a history buff, it's unlikely you've heard of him. This is despite the incredible impact he had on the ancient world. In this video, the first of two parts, we'll delve into the life of this fascinating figure and examine why he deserves recognition as one of the most influential people of his time. Philip was truly a visionary. He was born into a world of chaos and turmoil, but during his reign he brought stability and prosperity to Macedonia. He was the one who laid the foundation for Alexander the Great to conquer the known world. Despite the challenges, Philip's father Amantas III held on to the crown for a relatively long time, though at the cost of conceding power to outside forces and leaving Macedonia weakened. After Amantas' passing, Philip's oldest brother took the throne as Alexander II at just 18 while Philip was 12 years old. In 371, the city-state of Thebes defeated mighty Sparta at the Battle of Leuctra, which resulted in the Theban hegemony, a period of about 10 years where Thebes was the most powerful state in Greece. Hegemonic Thebes and Macedon were both competing for influence in Thessaly, but the Macedonians had to concede that they were not a match for them. In 369, the Theban general Pelopidas imposed peace on Macedonia and the warring states of Thessaly. Philip and 30 noble Macedonian offspring were taken captive and sent to Thebes as hostages, serving as bargaining chips in this fragile peace treaty. Philip's formative years then were spent in the cultured city of Thebes as a guest of Pamenes, a prominent and influential aristocrat. Despite being a captive, he was treated with warmth and hospitality. Pamenes was friends with the greatest military commander of the age, Epaminondas. It was he and another man named Pelopidas who brought his people to the heights of glory. Epaminondas was a devout follower of Pythagorean philosophy. He was known for his serious demeanor and interest in numbers and formulae, as well as his refusal to consume meat or participate in animal sacrifice. It's only natural to assume that Philip had absorbed some of the cutting-edge military tactics that he would later deploy as king of Macedonia, but all we can say for sure is that he spent three formative years in the household of leading members of Theban society. Tragedy struck in 368 as King Alexander II was assassinated during a festive war dance. Suspicion fell upon Ptolemy of Aloris, since it was he who benefited the most from Alexander's murder. With Philip's other brother Perdiccas too young to rule, Ptolemy installed himself as regent. Whether or not he took the title king, we don't know, but he was in all respects the ruler of Macedon. It was at this point that a distant relative of Philip, Pausanias, decided to stake his claim as king, and with a mercenary army he began to march on Pella, the capital of Macedonia. Ptolemy wasn't sure he could rely on the Macedonian army, so he chose diplomacy. He called on an Athenian commander, Ephicrates, who was in the area trying to re-establish Athens' control of the city of Amphipolis. Ephicrates combined his forces with Ptolemy and drove Pausanias off for the time being. In 365, Ptolemy was assassinated, either by Perdiccas or by someone working on his behalf, and Philip's second brother rose to power as the sole ruler of Macedon. Perdiccas struck a deal with Thebes, snubbing Athens, and as part of this agreement, Philip was finally freed from his years of captivity. After three long years, Philip returned home at the age of 17, ready to reclaim his place in the kingdom. But with Perdiccas now firmly in control, Philip's future remained uncertain. Would he be welcomed as a trusted ally or seen as a potential threat? In the year 360, a large army of Illyrians stormed into Molossia, a neighboring kingdom to Macedonia. Despite the valiant efforts of the Molossians, they were no threat to the invaders. The Illyrians were led by King Bardilus. He was almost 90 at this time, which is almost too incredible to believe, but he was still a formidable figure and could call on a large number of warriors. 
Bardilis now set his sights on Upper Macedonia, and Perdiccas rallied his forces to confront the invaders. In the late summer of 360, or possibly the spring of 359, a bloody battle took place. The details of the battle aren't clear, but what we do know is that the Macedonians suffered a catastrophic defeat. King Perdiccas was killed in battle, becoming the first known Macedonian monarch to fall to an enemy sword and an estimated 4,000 of his soldiers perished with him. Although Perdiccas did have a son, he was too young to take the throne, so Philip was installed as leader. Initially, this may have been as a regent. It's possible, though, that he was declared King of Macedon from this moment. We simply don't have detailed records of how he became king. Macedonia was still weak upon Philip's ascension, and the new king was faced with four dire threats. The first and greatest threat was that of Bardilus, who was still occupying Upper Macedonia. The second threat was that of the Paeonians, another tribe who were pushing into Macedonian territory from the east. Then there were two potential usurpers who were aiming for the throne itself. One of the usurpers we've already met, Pausanias. He had already been beaten once by Ptolemy, but he saw this chance to become king once again, and he leapt at it. The other pretender was a man named Argeus, who was also a distant relative of Philip's. Philip was now in charge of a kingdom that was on the verge of being dismembered. He took stock of his situation, and the weakness of Macedonia upon Philip's ascension cannot be overstated. Philip began his reign by calling a council of Macedonian notables. According to Diodorus Siculus, quote, bringing together the Macedonians in a series of assemblies and exhorting them with eloquent speeches to be men. He was courteous and sought to win over the multitudes by his gifts and his promises." End quote. The king then began the process of consolidating his power and reforming the army for confrontation with the enemies of Macedonia. The military machine that Alexander would use to sweep across the world was still a ways off, but the transformation of Macedonia from a backwater into a superpower started at this time. Philip began by introducing new tactics and equipment. The Macedonians still had a Homeric vision of warfare, where individual courage and prowess were prized. While living with the southern Greeks, Philip saw firsthand how devastating a cohesive fighting force could be. He transformed the standard Macedonian infantry unit into a phalanx, but one that was unlike anything seen in the south. Instead of relying on armored spearmen who were capable of fighting as individuals, Philip issued a new weapon, the sarissa, a pike some 16 to 18 feet long, which was held in both hands. It had a large iron spear point and, crucially, a heavy counterweight on the butt, allowing it to be held far back so that most of the weapon projected in front of the man welding it. Due to its size, you couldn't use it with the large and heavy hoplon, typically used by Greek hoplites. This was replaced with a smaller shield, no more than two feet in diameter, which was strapped to the left arm and shoulder. The standard Macedonian phalanx was eight ranks deep. The men in the ranks behind the fifth angled their pikes forward and up to offer some amount of protection against thrown missiles. The mere approach of this phalanx, with its hedgehog of glittering spearheads, was itself intimidating. In the second century BC, one experienced Roman commander described it as the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. Now that Philip was confident in his new army's ability, he decided now was the time to go on the attack. His first target would be the usurper, Argeus. The city of Amphipolis had thrown off Athenian domination more than 70 years previous with the help of Sparta. However, they still coveted their former colony. Athens decided to back Argeus in his bid for the Macedonian throne, but Philip saw that the city of Amphipolis was their real goal. Backing the pretender was merely a means to this end, so he decided to weaken their resolve. Philip recalled the garrison sent to Amphipolis by his brother and declared that the city was autonomous. He reasoned that if he renounced any Macedonian claim to Amphipolis and Argeus succeeded in becoming king, he would not be in a position to hand over the city to Athens since Macedonia no longer possessed it. 
In 359, an Athenian expedition landed in their allied city of Methany on the coast of Macedon. This was a force of 3,000 hoplites, led by a man named Mantius. Argeas met them there, bringing his own mercenary army. They divided their strength. The majority of the Athenian force stayed with their commander in Methany, while Argeas advanced with his own army, along with some Athenian observers. He led them to the city of Agai, which was one of the capital cities of Macedonia. He probably left the main force behind to obscure the fact that he was relying on foreigners. Arriving outside the city, he declared himself king and hoped that the locals would come out to acclaim him. They did not. Whether from trust or affection from Philip, dislike of Argeas, or just doubts about his chance of success. Argeas retreated, but due to their forced march, his men were tired and dispirited. By now, word had reached Philip of the pretender's acclamation, and now it was Philip's turn to move quickly, and he mustered his army and force-marched them to meet Argeas. They fought a battle, which was in actuality more of a large skirmish, and Philip defeated the pretender. Even if it wasn't a famous battle, it was Philip's first victory on the battlefield, and it was a large psychological boost for the Macedonians. The Athenians that were present were spared, and Philip allowed them to return to Methany. Argeas, along with any Macedonian present, weren't so fortunate, and they were promptly executed. Mantius had tried to take the city of Amphipolis by storm, but failed. One down, three to go. Philip next turned to deal with the other pretender, Pausanias. He was being backed by the Thracians. A very formidable king named Cotys had recently united many of the Thracian tribes, but he had recently died. Philip knew that a succession war loomed, and since they would be distracted, he simply bribed one of the princes to stop backing Pausanias. This prince was more interested in Philip's gold and didn't want to risk outright war on the pretender's behalf in the hope of gaining plunder and influence. Pausanias vanishes from the sources at this point, so the deal was likely sealed with his death. Two threats down, two to go. Like most great leaders, Philip was also lucky. Early in his reign, he'd been forced to buy peace from the Paeonians, but their leader had also died at an opportune time for Macedon. He realized that they would also be preoccupied by a succession crisis, so he mustered the Macedonian army and marched against the leaderless Paeonians. He defeated them in battle and forced their leaders to swear allegiance to him. Philip had now dealt with three of the four threats to the Macedonians. Now there was only one challenger left, who was also the most formidable. In 358, Philip once again summoned the Macedonian notables and made a grand speech promising glory and victory when they met Bardilus and the Illyrians in battle. He marched at the head of an army of 10,000 infantry and 600 cavalry. By now, it was Bardilus who wanted to talk. He sent a proposal to Philip that each monarch could have peace on the precondition that they would hold on to whatever territory they currently controlled. Philip rejected the offer outright. He demanded that the Illyrians leave Macedonian territory immediately or prepare for battle. Bardilus, in turn, gathered his forces. He had a comparable army of 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. The Illyrians were famous for their loud war cries that would usually intimidate the Macedonians. Some ancient commentators claimed that you could tell the outcome of a battle by listening to the shouts raised by each side, but this ability alone wouldn't save them. The Macedonian infantry were formed with the royal bodyguard on the right. Philip advanced, ordering his cavalry to sweep around the Illyrians' flanks. Bardilus' cavalry isn't mentioned, which suggests they dismounted and fought on foot. Seeing the threat of encirclement, Bardilus pulled his men back until they formed a large hollow square. Diodorus tells us that the battle was hard fought and that the combat swayed back and forth for some time with heavy casualties on both sides. Even Philip's best troops were not especially experienced, while the Illyrians were confident of beating the Macedonians once again. The side most able to hold on and keep going forward to renew the fight was most likely to win. Philip and the companion cavalry fought well, and after some time, his cavalry managed to break into Bardilus's square formation. 
This was no mean feat in an era when horsemen were not expected to defeat determined men on foot in a head-to-head -head encounter. Fatigue and the continued aggression of the Macedonians meant that this time it was the Illyrians who started to give way. And once the formation was broken, it quickly dissolved into panicked flight. Diodorus claims that 7,000 Illyrian warriors died in the battle or in the pursuit afterwards. The square formation will have made it harder than usual for men to escape once the army collapsed. Showing a similar understanding of how things were done, Bardillus sent envoys to beg for peace. Philip reclaimed all the lost territory of Upper Macedonia as the price of granting it. This was a major victory against a truly formidable opponent, and although we know of the successes to come, we shouldn't forget that Philip had taken a big gamble. For the moment, all the pretenders were defeated or in exile, and the immediate threats had been beaten off. In the process, Philip had begun to recover lost regions and assert his dominance over neighbors. He'd survived his first crisis, but Philip still had a lot of work to do to transform Macedonia into the superpower of the ancient world. And that's it for today's video. In the next episode, we'll see Philip become the leading figure in all of Greece and the birth of the young Alexander the Great.